with heavy tidings, for which I called upon the house and the nation. When the clock struck midnight, marking the final moments of 1943 and the new year of 1944 began, World War II continued at a rapidly accelerating pace. All eyes turned to London as the preparations for Operation Overlord, the long-awaited Allied invasion of northern France, were finalised. In Germany, Adolf Hitler and his high-ranking officials knew all too well that the invasion forces would soon be on their way, but where they would land, and perhaps more importantly, when they would cross the channel, was yet to be revealed. Hitler's public appearances were now very rare, and the Führer struggled to come to terms with the reality of the German situation. On all sides, his position was becoming daily more untenable, with the Allies making good progress in both the European and Pacific theatres of war. With his henchmen all around him, Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Göring to name but a few, Hitler grew increasingly withdrawn and was often irrational in his decision-making. Even those closest to him finally began to realise that their leader was no longer the great saviour of Germany that they had once believed him to be. It's quite often overlooked, but as we progress to consider the blueprint for victory and the build-up to Operation Overlord, there was actually a much smaller scale Allied invasion of France back in 1942. On August 19th, a joint British and Canadian commando raid was made on the French port of Dieppe as 5,000 troops plus 50 American Rangers and half as many again free French soldiers took part in Operation Jubilee. Although unsuccessful, it did give the Allies vital information to help them plan a future assault on the French coast that would eventually take shape as the D-Day landings. The casualties at Dieppe were a disaster for the Allies, especially for the Canadians, while all equipment and vehicles were abandoned on the beaches. Interestingly, on hearing the news, Hitler mocked his enemy, saying, The British have had the courtesy to cross the sea to offer the enemy a complete sample of their weapons. But later, when he briefed his commanders, Hitler's tone was far more reflective when he told them, We must realise that we are not alone in learning from the lesson from Dieppe. The British have also learned we must reckon with a totally different method of attack and at a different place. Dieppe may have been a minor blip on the radar of this global war, but like so many operations that failed to achieve their objectives, it nonetheless made a major contribution to the bigger picture. 
Meanwhile, the fighting for North Africa was over, and the Allies quickly made the most of their advantage, putting plans to take the attack to southern Europe via Italy into action. Operation Husky was their first offensive, focused on the island of Sicily, and after a swift victory, the campaign for Italy seemed to be theirs for the taking. Yet in war, the tide can turn in the blink of an eye, and the fight for Italy was anything but a foregone conclusion. Hitler was unable to prevent the Italians from surrendering, and therefore ordered a German invasion of his former comrade-in-arms, Benito Mussolini's nation. This made the push for control of Rome by British, American and Canadian troops a much tougher task than had ever been anticipated. Despite the difficulties faced by the Allies in Italy as 1943 had come to a close, plans for the liberation of France in the spring or summer of 44 were now unstoppable. As the Russians continued to attack the Germans from the east, and the Americans battled for supremacy in the Pacific, Great Britain prepared to play host to the mightiest invasion force the world had ever seen. No matter how positive the news was of Allied progress around the globe, those that Hitler had condemned to the concentration camps, whether Jews, Poles or Gypsies, faced greater suffering than ever. Yet another concentration camp opened in Poland on New Year's Day, having previously been a forced labour camp tyrannised by its commandant Amnon Goth. His sadistic treatment of inmates was highlighted in the poignant film Schindler's List, warning a whole new generation of the true horrors of war. Even so, there was a growing resistance to Axis oppression, with brave individuals often making a personal stand against those who preyed on innocent civilians simply caught up in the conflict. In the Philippines, an American mining engineer by the name of Wendell Fertig had refused to surrender when the Japanese had taken the islands back in 1942. A civilian himself, he went deep into the jungle and built up a force of several thousand Filipinos, and together they constantly harassed the increasingly tyrannical Japanese army of occupation. Wendell Fertig only ceased his guerrilla activities in the jungles of the Philippines when the American general, Douglas MacArthur, returned to take the islands back from the Japanese later in 1944, just as he had promised he would do. In the meantime, the British Royal Air Force had been systematically bombing Berlin for some time, and they planned a further air raid for the first night of the new year. Bad weather forced a brief postponement, but by January 2nd, it was business as usual, with Hitler's seat of power under siege yet again. Just as it was business as usual for the British pilots, the Americans continued to advance their campaign for New Guinea and New Britain out in the Pacific. Japan was still a long way away, but for the Russians, their target of reaching Germany was getting closer by the day. On January 3rd, the Red Army were within 10 miles of what had been the Polish border back in 1939, leaving Adolf Hitler in no doubt whatsoever that a Russian breakthrough was not far off. More pressing on Hitler's mind, however, was the Allies' cross-channel invasion. A 
American and British aircraft began Operation Carpetbagger on the 4th, dropping arms and supplies to resistance groups in France, Holland, Belgium and Italy as the Allies' carefully planned preparations were being slotted into place. It was also time for the Allies to start calling the main protagonists entrusted with leading Operation Overlord to London. General Bernard Montgomery, now Sir Bernard, having been knighted by King George VI in recognition of his victory at El Alamein, had returned to England from Italy to take command of the British contingent of the Allied Expeditionary Force. To his men, Monty, as they fondly knew him, was a hero they would follow to the ends of the earth, but for those in command of him, Monty could be something of a loose cannon. He was extraordinarily valuable in the fight against Hitler, but it was commonly quoted that Montgomery was great to serve under, difficult to serve alongside, but hell to serve over. For whoever was in overall charge of Operation Overlord, earning the respect of Monty was crucial if this brilliant but difficult general was going to fulfill his undoubted potential. The decision regarding the appointment of a Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Invasion Force had been taken back in 1943. And in January 44, it was time for the American General Dwight D. Eisenhower to take up his position in London. On Winston Churchill's home territory, working with the maverick British Prime Minister was always going to be a challenge, and with Monty already in situ too, it was going to require a very firm hand on the helm to keep the invasion plan on track. Even now, in the 21st century, when people are asked to name the heroes of the Second World War, it's rare for Dwight D. Eisenhower to come top of many lists. Yet without Eisenhower's calm attitude, steely determination, quiet politeness and brilliant military mind, the outcome of World War II might have been very different indeed. So, before going any further, we'll take a brief look at the man charged with the successful execution of Operation Overlord, who is also destined to become the 34th President of the USA. Born David Dwight Eisenhower in Grayson County, Texas, on October 14, 1890, his childhood nickname, Ike, stuck with him throughout his life. Remarkably, both of his parents were pacifists, but this didn't prevent him from attending West Point Military Academy, as they believed it would provide him with the best possible education. With the outbreak of the First World War, while Eisenhower was at West Point, he inevitably took up a military career. But even when the Americans entered the conflict in 1917, Eisenhower's duties in the tank corps kept him close to home. After the armistice was signed in 1918, Eisenhower forged ahead with his military career during the 20s and 30s, working under the command of such powerful men as General Douglas MacArthur. When World War II broke out in 39, Eisenhower had earned a first-class reputation as an administrator, and he found himself serving with MacArthur in the Philippines. Promotions came quickly, and when Eisenhower returned to America to take up posts in Washington, California, and Texas, he rose from Lieutenant Colonel to Brigadier General, attached to the general staff in Washington by the close of 1941. Before long, Eisenhower became Assistant Chief of Staff in the Operations Division, and his obvious administrative abilities led to his appointment as Commanding General European Theatre of Operations in London. 
It was after this that he became supreme commander of the Allied forces in North Africa, and as the battle moved to Italy, after Rommel had been driven out of Tunis, Eisenhower went with the action. He might not have been a soldier on the battlefield, locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but the rare gifts that the mild-mannered Texan possessed were equally as valuable in the fight against Hitler. And it was time for Eisenhower to show the world that he was up to the task now being asked of him as he arrived in London to take command of Operation Overlord. It was of vital importance as Eisenhower and the top brass of military commanders settled down to refine the plans for the D-Day landings that the people of Britain did all that they could to help the war effort. On the home front, the government became ever more involved in the education of the population so that every individual could play their part. From early instructions to dig for victory to encourage food production, measures had been taken to keep everyone eating healthily. By the beginning of 1944, rationing had been a way of life for years, and teaching families to make the most of their weekly allowances was considered a government matter. The Ministry of Food had drafted in home economists to encourage healthy eating as imaginative recipes were dreamt up to make tasty meals from whatever was available, and popular entertainers were often recruited to the cause. As we know, the first rationing in 1940 was of bacon, butter and sugar, quickly followed by meat, tea, jam, biscuits, breakfast cereals, cheese, eggs, milk, canned fruit and sweets. Some foods occasionally appeared off-ration, such as whale meat, but even the Ministry's cleverest cooks struggled to find ways to make it palatable. The whole idea of rationing was to ensure that whether to the rich or the poor, food and essential items were distributed fairly. It would be unrealistic to think that there wasn't a thriving black market, however, because although the vast majority of the people of Britain were both law-abiding and public-spirited, there were still some for whom money talked, despite the government's best efforts. Interestingly, despite food in the shops being rationed, meals served in restaurants were not. By the end of 1944, it was estimated that 9% of all food was eaten outside the home, with establishments known as British restaurants opening up all over the country. Typically charging less than a shilling for a three-course meal, they provided plain wholesome food wherever a suitable building could be found. Laws were brought in so that even the most exclusive London restaurants were not permitted to charge more than five shillings and three courses were the maximum allowed. It was also compulsory for factories, so vital to the war effort, to provide canteens, as the government made sure that the population was as well-fed and healthy as possible in order to work at full capacity. It wasn't only food that was rationed. Over time, clothing, petrol and even soap was controlled by coupons. Fashion definitely had to take a back seat, with any clothes available having to conform to the utility standard, which meant minimal fabric, no turn-ups and no frills. Nylon stockings were a thing of the past, as ladies painted their legs with whatever they could find, and gravy browning seamed with eyebrow pencil proved to be a popular choice. But when the GIs started to arrive in Britain in 1942, they actually brought with them such luxuries as nylon stockings, along with chocolate, chewing gum and cigarettes, which did make the American servicemen very popular indeed. The term GI actually came about because all of the US soldiers' equipment was stamped with the words Government Issue, which was quickly abbreviated to GI.
Eisenhower's fellow countrymen were a glamorous addition to the very ordered, duty-bound existence of the women on Britain's home front, and throughout 1944, their numbers rapidly increased. This didn't always bode well for Anglo-American relations though, not least because the men left on the home front tended to be viewed as second-rate for not being in uniform. The expression, overpaid, oversexed and over here, was often used by the British men to describe the GIs, but from the ladies they danced and romanced, there were noticeably fewer complaints. Nevertheless, there were broken hearts aplenty, especially with an estimated one and a half million GIs stationed in Britain in the run-up to D-Day. In excess of 15,000 of them married girls from the UK in 1944 alone, while the GI bride phenomenon, meaning that many of these young women moved to America either during or after the war. But it was rarely a case of happy ever after, they often married after a whirlwind romance of no more than days, and the stark reality of life in a different country, thousands of miles from their families, meant that quite a number of these marriages ended in divorce. Also, many thousands of girls became pregnant by American soldiers, often causing devastation within British families that continued long after the GIs had gone home. It's therefore not surprising that the British men left on the home front were unhappy about the conduct of their allies, with whom they simply couldn't compete, especially as they were generally overlooked by the female population, being mostly elderly, in poor health, in less glamorous occupations that were exempt from the call-up, or worst of all, draft dodgers. There was also a group known as conscientious objectors who were permitted to register not to fight if their religion or their beliefs prevented them from doing so. Several of them were sent to work in British coal mines, but this didn't stop them from being branded as cowards for not being in uniform. Late in 1943, and moving into 44, this had a surprisingly adverse effect on another group of miners, who found themselves digging for coal for a very different reason. Known as the Bevin Boys, they were often mistaken by the community at large for conscientious objectors and shunned for cowardice. This was indeed an injustice, as they worked incredibly long hours in the most difficult of conditions, and without them, the British nation and the entire war effort would have been brought to a complete standstill. In Britain's wartime coalition, under Churchill's leadership, there was a number of specially designated ministries, and alongside the Ministry of Food, there was also a Ministry of Labour and National Service, overseen by Ernest Bevin. As early as May 1939, after Hitler's troops had marched into Czechoslovakia, the Military Training Act was passed, giving the British government the power to call up men between the ages of 20 and 22 for six months military training. After war was declared, the National Service Armed Forces Act became law, and men aged between 18 and 40 were called up, although this was extended in 1941 to include men up to the age of 51. There were some occupations exempt from the call-up, such as engineering and coal mining, but men could still volunteer. Early in the war, many coal miners did just this, before the government really appreciated what a problem it would become as fewer and fewer men remained at the coalface. 
legislation had been put in place to deal with such situations, courtesy of the Emergency Powers Act of 1940, followed by the Essential Works Order a year later, meaning that those left on the home front could be conscripted into essential industries. However, the majority of the potential conscripts were women who could not be sent down the mines, and although Bevin put out an urgent plea for men to volunteer, understandably, there were few prepared to step forward. With a real threat of the coal miners who did remain taking industrial action, Bevin needed to act fast. The minister devised a system whereby a percentage of those conscripted for national service would be allocated to the mines. Each week, some say from his own hat, Bevin would draw a number between zero and nine. Any of the men called up that week with a national service number ending with that digit would be ordered to the mines rather than into the armed forces. It was not a popular course of action, and it blighted Bevin's political career, but it was effective, and these hard-working miners got their name after a speech Bevin gave in an effort to inspire them. We need 720,000 men continuously employed in this industry. This is where you boys come in. Our fighting men will not be able to achieve their purpose unless we get an adequate supply of coal. Bevin's boys certainly played their part, but their service to king and country has only been properly recognised in more recent times, which is ironic, as unlike those conscripted into the armed forces, they were not released from duty until many years after the war had ended. While Britain faced the challenges of food and fuel shortages with resilience, the cross-channel invasion was transformed from a distant dream into an actual reality, and the propaganda machine in Germany went into overdrive to persuade civilians that the war was still going their way. And it wasn't only their own people that they tried to influence. German propaganda radio broadcasts were made in England to undermine the Allied position, directly targeting civilians throughout the English-speaking nations. In a program called Germany Calling, a fictitious character called Lord Hawhaw warned of treachery on the part of the Allied leaders. In January 1944, he suggested they were all about to be handed over to the Russians, playing on the British and American fear of communism. It was hoped that the British public in particular would pressurise Churchill into agreeing a peaceful settlement with Hitler, but such a broadcast only served to convince Allied intelligence that the Nazis were now clutching at straws. The most famous voice to play Lord Hawhaw was the American-born but Irish-raised William Joyce, who left England for Germany at the beginning of the war. As a senior member of the British Union of Fascists, he would have been interned, but instead he became a naturalised German citizen. Joyce was captured in Germany by the British shortly before the end of the war and hanged for treason. Although not a British subject, it was argued that as Joyce had once lied to obtain a British passport, it was therefore his nation of choice, making him guilty of treason, a capital offence. Hitler too was now getting to a stage where he was clutching at straws almost daily. The Führer was convinced in the early weeks of 1944 that all he needed to do was develop the jet aircraft to fight back against the anticipated Allied landings. He declared that, if I get a few hundred of them to the front line, it will exorcise the spectre of invasion for all time. It was just another example of Hitler losing his ability for logical thinking and decision-making. Another problem faced by Berlin was how to explain the defeat of the Germans, and more particularly, Erwin Rommel in North Africa. 
They had boasted that Rommel was an unbeatable military genius, so what to do with him next was something of a problem. After a while, he was sent to Italy, but when the new year began, just as Eisenhower was called by the Allies to London, Rommel was called to defend the Axis position in France. There's no doubt that Rommel's military instincts were remarkable, and although at this time his fellow commander Gerd von Rundstedt firmly believed the Allied attack would come from Dover to Calais, Rommel was convinced that Normandy would be the chosen destination. As a result, Hitler's once highly favoured Desert Fox spent the months of January and February 1944 surveying the beaches and countryside of Normandy. Mines and traps were laid along the shoreline, and any field that would have been a secure landing site for aircraft or paratroopers was either flooded or spiked with what became famous as Rommel's asparagus. These were long poles driven into the ground that made it impossible for planes or military personnel to land. Even though it would be months before he was destined to be proved correct, for the time being at least, all Rommel could do was back his hunch. One place where German troops had managed to hold ground was in Italy. Despite the Allies enjoying a head start, the Germans were now well and truly dug in around Monte Cassino, and they would have to be driven out if the Allies were to stand any chance of reaching Rome. On January 12th, the French Corps attempted to capture the town of Cassino, but to no avail. The Germans held firm, leaving the Allies no choice but to wait for another opportunity. It was nonetheless only a brief moment of triumph for Hitler, as elsewhere his troops were coming under attack on all sides. Across German-occupied Europe, partisans were rising up against their oppressors. In Yugoslavia, the leader of the revolutionaries, General Tito, was a constant thorn in the Nazi side. And what's more, by this time, he was receiving considerable aid from the air, courtesy of the British and the Americans. And of course, Russia continued to be a dangerous drain on Hitler's resources. On January 15th, the Red Army finally broke through the German defences around Leningrad. The fight was so fierce that the Russians took few prisoners. With more than 60,000 German soldiers killed as the Red Army cleared the entire Leningrad province. Back in Italy, the British had now joined the French in the battle for Cassino, but once again the Germans repelled their advances. North of Cassino, as the Americans advanced towards Italy's Rapido River, they were also planning a daring landing from the sea at Anzio, just to the south of Rome. While Eisenhower met with his commanders in London to discuss Operation Overlord on January 21st, British and American troops, escorted by 28 warships, sailed from Naples in Operation Shingle, the codename for the landings at Anzio. Just minutes after midnight, the troops went ashore. The 227 Germans based there were caught completely by surprise and offered little resistance. In 24 hours, 36 Allied servicemen had safely landed, with the loss of only 13 lives.
Hitler had instructed his men to hold Italy at all costs, and within days, the Allies realized that despite their early success, Anzio was far from being secure. German aircraft struck on January 23rd, sinking British support ships, preventing tanks and heavy artillery being brought ashore. The American commander at Anzio hesitated, with disastrous consequences, giving the Germans the opportunity to rush in reinforcements. As the Germans learnt to their cost at Anzio, military intelligence was of vital importance, as knowing that the Allies were on their way would have made all the difference. At Bletchley Park, an elegant mansion at the heart of the British countryside, coded Axis messages were intercepted and deciphered. Not only were the Allies able to track what the Germans were planning, they were also able to ensure that the false intelligence they were feeding the enemy was getting through. With Operation Overlord imminent, this was crucial as every effort was made to take all German attention away from Normandy. As part of Operation Fortitude, a sophisticated and elaborate campaign to deceive the Germans over the proposed landing beaches of Operation Overlord, for every reconnaissance flight over Normandy, two were dispatched over the Pas de Calais. The 1st United States Army Group, commanded by the notorious American General Blood and Guts Patton, was in fact a total fabrication but the decoded messages from the Germans told the Allies that Hitler was moving troops from Russia in preparation to counter Patton and his imaginary men at Calais. The 12th British Army made up of the 15th British Motorised Division, the 34th British Infantry Division, the 8th British Armoured Division and the 7th Polish Infantry Division likewise only ever existed on paper. And apart from Rommel's gut feeling about Normandy, the disinformation campaign was working perfectly. However, for those fighting in Italy, Russia and out in the Pacific, the battles were anything but imaginary. The Americans had been making good progress in the Pacific since 1943, gradually advancing towards the Mariana Islands, which would give them a strategically important base from which to launch attacks on Japan. But before they could reach the Marianas, they would need to take the Marshall Islands. On February 1st, a huge American landing operation overwhelmed the Japanese armies of occupation. But despite this, the defenders of the three islands under attack chose to fight to the death rather than surrender. For Japan, the casualties were high. Out of 8,000 of them in one island, 7,870 were killed, with the Americans losing less than 400 men. Even so, a full assault on Tokyo was still a very long way off, and the war in Europe would need to be concluded before the question of how to defeat the Japanese could be addressed. In London, Eisenhower was totally absorbed with plans for Operation Overlord, as he and his senior commanders realized just what a huge planning commitment they'd taken on. Scientists, technical experts, and a formidable intelligence operation would be crucial, and for the few people with the security clearance to be aware of the details, it seemed an impossible task. At Buckingham Palace, George VI was kept informed of Overlord's progress, and noting his thoughts in his diary for February 44, he gives us a rare insight into the apprehension felt by those responsible for leading the daring operation. The King wrote, The more one goes into it, the more alarming it becomes.
Another operation that was rapidly taking on alarming proportions was the battle the Allies were having in Italy, attempting to hold their position on the beachhead at Anzio. The landing that had started with such promise for the Allies was being held off by the determined attacks of the Germans. And just a short distance away at Casino, Hitler's troops were doing an equally good job of keeping the Allies at bay. As February wore on, the battle for Casino urgently needed to be resolved if the Allies were going to be able to take Rome before the start of Operation Overlord. Leaflets were dropped addressed to Italian friends, telling them to leave the ancient monastery of Monte Cassino as an Allied attack was imminent. It was a timely warning just prior to 400 tons of bombs being dropped on the magnificent early medieval shrine, killing the bishop and 250 civilian refugees sheltering there. Alongside the Americans, Canadians and the British, Maori, Indian and Gurkha troops fought hand-to-hand -hand against the German defenders amongst the ruins, and still the Allies failed to dislodge them from their vantage point. In the skies over Europe, the Allies continued to bomb Berlin, while the Germans in retaliation bombed London. With alarming accuracy, four people were killed in an air raid virtually on the doorstep of the Prime Minister's home at No. 10 Downing Street. But fortunately for Churchill, he was away from home at the time. For the RAF, the bombing raids on Germany were very costly in terms of planes lost and men killed, but Churchill, as ever, was quick to defend his actions. With all thoughts focused on the liberation of France, he said, the air offensive constitutes the foundation upon which our plans for overseas invasion stand. At the same time as the major cities of Britain and Germany were being bombed, the Americans were equally busy bombing the Japanese in the Pacific, sinking warships, merchant ships and aircraft, as well as taking another of the Marshall Islands. However, the Japanese were successful in scoring direct hits on American warships off the coast of Iwo Jima. As was now expected, any survivors were slaughtered by the Japanese and there were British warships that suffered a similar fate in the Indian Ocean. A new tactic emerged because as soon as Japan's submarines had sunk the enemy ships, they surfaced in order to machine gun the survivors clinging to the life rafts. There was little respect for a prisoner of war's human rights from the Japanese, and in the concentration camps the Germans behaved with equal contempt for their fellow man. In Dachau, though, where so many atrocities had been committed, it's interesting to note that a clerk at the camp took a brave step. On February 22nd, 31 Soviet prisoners of war were dragged out of barracks and executed, and the clerk simply recorded their names, each and every one of them. Of the millions killed in concentration camps, the majority were nameless victims of the Holocaust. But this particular clerk gave the dead men their dignity, creating a list that would one day provide evidence against those responsible for committing such barbaric crimes. Spring was now upon the Allies, as February gave way to March, and with the time for the invasion drawing ever closer, Allied military intelligence worked tirelessly to pull all elements of the deception plans for Operation Overlord into place. In Moscow, the Soviets gave their blessing to the Anglo-American disinformation campaigns and added an interesting one of their own, creating a spurious landing off the coast of Norway.
there were still setbacks as a further Allied attack on Monte Cassino still failed to secure the location and German troops marched into Hungary. Yet Hitler's stranglehold on power was slipping away from him as some of his own officers were beginning to question his authority. From his early days as Germany's Chancellor, Hitler had always feared the possibility of assassination. He had after all made many enemies along the way, but the fact that the plots were now being discussed amongst his own men made everyone around him a danger. Without a doubt, the Führer's days were numbered, but the damage he was still capable of inflicting upon the Allies was a very real danger to the success of Operation Overlord, which was gathering momentum by the hour. In London, there were endless rounds of top-secret briefings, as those Eisenhower had charged with making sure that everything was ready for the invasion were working around the clock. And all the while, the British wartime spirit prevailed as the citizens of London went about their day-to-day -day businesses as cheerfully as they could. Whether working in shops, offices or factories, everyone was doing their bit for the war effort. And in the evenings, they would volunteer as air raid wardens and fire watchers to keep the city as safe as possible, whatever Hitler threw their way. The fate of the free world lay in the hands of the experts hidden away in the lofty war offices of London, planning the largest and most audacious invasion force yet known to man. If it failed, Hitler would have a chance of turning the war back in his favour, and with an operation of such epic proportions, the Allies would have little left to attack again. The air raid warnings continued to scream out and the bombs still fell on the streets of London. But as Hitler had learned to his cost, here was a people that refused to be crushed. Life went on and people made the best of whatever pleasures they could find. The West End theatres might struggle to put on a show in the evenings, but the lunchtime concert became a popular wartime phenomenon. The venues were unusual. The National Gallery was a great favourite, popularised by the classic pianist Dame Myra Hess, and Londoners from all walks of life took time out from their busy schedules to be soothed by the lyrical melodies of Beethoven, Brahms and Mozart. It was indeed the calm before the storm. Out of the corridors of power in London, the blueprint for victory had been written and D-Day was literally just a heartbeat away. <laughs> <laughs>